The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To herald your love in the morning. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty, before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. You may be seated for Psalm 16.
Passion Reading, Part 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, also called the Passover, drew near. And Jesus said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man will be given over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and scribes assembled with the elders of the people in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted how they might take Jesus craftily and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, one of the twelve. He went, on, he went his way to the chief priests and captains and spoke together with them how he might betray Jesus to them. They were glad to hear him. He said to them, What will you give me to betray him to you? They promised to give him money and agreed with him for thirty pieces of silver. He accepted, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him in the absence of the multitude. 
Then came the first day of unleavened bread when they sacrificed the Passover lamb. Jesus sent to Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, Go into the city, and when you have entered the city, watch for a man bearing a pitcher of water. When he meets you, follow him into the house where he enters. And you shall say to the man who lives there, The master says to you, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house. Where is there room for me to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them. They came into the city and found it as he had told them, and they made ready the Passover. When the hour was come, Jesus sat down and the apostles with him. As they were eating, he said, I have longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Truly I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of my Father. And there is also a strife among them as to which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority over them are called benefactors. It shall not be so among you. He that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that serves. For who is greater, he that sits at the table or he that serves? Is it not he that sits at the table? For I am among you as a servant. You are they who have continued with me in my temptations. I appoint you to a kingdom as my Father has appointed me. You shall eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now Jesus knew that his hour was come to depart from the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Already Satan had put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. He arose from supper, laid aside his garments, and girded himself with a towel. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel with which he was girded. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not know now, but after these things you will understand. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my head and my hands. And Jesus said to him, he who has been bathed does not need to wash more than his feet, for he is clean altogether. You are clean, but not all of you. He knew who was going to betray him. That was why he said not everyone was clean. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me the Master and the Lord, and it is good that you say this, for so I am. If I, I, then your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have done this to show you the way to do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his Lord, 
neither is he that is greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, happier you if you do them. I do not speak of you all. I know whom I have chosen. The scripture must be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me has lifted his heel against me. Already now I tell you of this, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever receives anyone whom I shall send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus has said these things, his spirit was in turmoil. He bore witness and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another dumbfounded about whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was leaning on Jesus' bosom. Simon Peter said to him, Ask who it is of whom he is speaking. The disciple who was reclining on Jesus' chest said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, It is the one to whom I shall give the piece of bread after I have dipped it. And he dipped the piece of bread he had in his hand and gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And after the piece of bread had been dipped, Simon, Satan entered into that one. Jesus said to him, What you are doing, do quickly. No one at the table knew what the purpose was of what Jesus had said to him. Because Judas kept the money bag, some thought Jesus had told him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. What that man had when that man had received the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and in him God is glorified. And if God is glorified in him, God will glorify him in himself, and at once he will glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. For this I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but afterwards you will follow me. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God.
in our reading from Isaiah, selected verses from 52 and 53. This is the basis of the sermon this evening. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a, dry, a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. And he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteem him not. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O oh Lord, I command my spirit. You have redeemed me, O oh Lord, God of truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands I Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us pray. We thank you, Father, that you gather us together again today. What a gift it is to be a part of your people, to be a part of the communion of saints, your holy Christian church. And we pray that as we have now come together, you would let your spirit work in us as you have promised, that we may grow in faith and love, and, and that we may not only walk through this life, but finally walk into eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, what did Jesus look like? One of the striking things, as much as the Bible talks about Jesus, it never talks to us, well, about what he looked like. If it was light out, you could see all the images of Jesus in, in this church. Well, we don't get to see those at night, do we? The remarkable thing to me is they all kind of look Midwestern and a little Germanic. But if you were from Finland, your Jesus would be blonde hair and blue-eyed. And if you were from the Orient, he'd be a little Asian. It's the way we do things. We, we picture Jesus as we see other people. And that's, and to a degree, that's, that's okay. Because Jesus came in the flesh of humans. And, and it's good that we all relate to him because that's what he came for. I mean, he did come, though, in the first century, as a first century Jew, and so he pretty much looked and acted like one. But we really don't know what Jesus truly looked like. But the few descriptions we get, well, truthfully, they're not very attractive. But appearances can be deceiving. Maybe the best place we see, though, is from the prophet Isaiah. Because the prophet Isaiah talks about Jesus, that he is marred beyond human semblance. And that is a description of his crucifixion. That after he took the beatings of the Romans, after he was abused with physical slaps and slaps of wood, and after he was whipped with these cords that made his body basically looking like raw hamburger, there was not much left to look at. It's the reality of a crucifixion and the way the Romans did things. It wasn't pretty, but the Romans wanted to make those people pay who were going to suffer this most humiliating death. And they did. He was abused beyond human recognition. 
hung naked on the cross to humiliate him before his people. There he hung. Weak, humbled, and helpless. And what we hear from Isaiah about him before that doesn't sound much better, right? He had no form or majesty that people would be attracted to him. He was an average man who now was suffering the worst of things. The the beatings, the crucifixion, the agony, the days-long agony under normal situations of a crucifixion. They could last up to five days as they had been tortured and as they struggled for breath. We don't like that picture of Jesus too quickly. We rebel against it even. In my last congregation, we put in stained glass windows in our building as they had done previously. And in one of the drawings for the stained glass windows was a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross with a big piece of hair hanging over his face. And I had one of the pious ladies of the congregation object to it. It didn't make Jesus look nice. And some of the others agreed with her. Because we want Jesus to look nice. But here's the problem. His appearance was marred beyond human resemblance. He was not a good, attractive thing to see. And it seemed to bring nothing but humility and defeat. But appearances can be deceiving. The ugliness is real. But it's the ugliness that sin produces. We so often look at our own sin and we want to push it off as not being important or not affecting other people. It's between me and whoever. Nobody else do I have to answer to. It's only about me and how I feel. And we don't care about an effect on our husbands and our wives and our children and our families. What we worry about is us. And that is the ugliness of sin in us. That is the the way sin has tarnished our thinking and our thoughts. It's the reality. And where our sin and disobedience leads, well, it leads to the brokenness of this world, doesn't it? But it also led Jesus to the cross. For that's where our sin and disobedience finally lead. It's to death. It's to punishment. It is to the wrath of God poured out, but not upon us as it ought to be, but upon Jesus. Paul says that Jesus was obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. That's the ugliness that sin produces. The ugliness that maybe we don't recognize in ourselves. But the ugliness that God at the very least sees. And it's poured out on him who is marred beyond human semblance. And it was ugly. And it looked like a loss. But appearances can be deceiving. From from that cross that God has given to us the beauty of Jesus. As Paul puts it, he became sin who knew no sin. He became sin for us. That he was so totally identified with our sin that it would go to a cross and that God would not simply look at him and say, well, he is my son, but he poured down his wrath on him because he looked at him and saw us and our sin and all the things that we have done to bring God's anger about. But here's the beauty. He, became, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. You see, we've received the holiness of Jesus to stand before God forever. We have received from Jesus 
the purity that is necessary to be in His presence. We have received from Him even the good works that we produce are produced through Jesus. The righteousness that is Jesus has become ours, even as He has become our sin. And that cross was ugly, make no mistake. It was looking like defeat. Satan rejoiced as Jesus died. And yet, appearances can be deceiving. For right there, Jesus won his victory. Right there, you and I had our sins paid for. And right there, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be the people of God. That's the gift we have. And it carries over not just to our relationship with God, but it it goes out here amongst the people. Because the reality is appearances can be deceiving. And it's easy to look at the people of God around us. It's easy to pick out our sin and weakness in other people and to dwell on it. It's what we are given to do. It is how we tend to act. We judge people more than we judge ourselves. We forget to take the long look in the mirror and we're very eager to look at others and to point out that sin and that weakness. And yet here's the truth. We are gathered around the cross of Jesus. For we are all one in Adam's sin. But we are also one as the Spirit has come to us and made us children of God. The one that's easy to pick out their sin and their weakness, Christ died for that one. And we are all fellow believers. You see, here's part of the problem. Is we want to deal with one another directly. We want to be able to look at that person and on our terms deal with them. And they with us. But the reality is this. We need to look at others the way God does. We need to look at our fellow believers the way God does. For the Father looks and sees not who we are apart from Christ, but he looks at us only through Jesus. And that is what we're called to do too. Is to look at one another And see not merely the sin and the weakness that's so easy to find and pick out. But to see that beauty which is Christ. The one who has come. The one who lives through faith with his children. So we see need to see the beauty of one another. The beauty that comes from Jesus. Appearances can be so deceiving. Jesus on the cross looked like utter defeat, a man marred beyond human semblance. And yet, there's our salvation. It's easy when we do begin to look honestly and treat ourselves honestly in the mirror of God's Word as we look at ourselves to see the depth of our sin and our selfishness and our rebellion against our God. And yet, as children of God, That can be deceiving. For we are also His holy children, called in Christ to be His. And it looks and appearances can be deceiving. For it's so easy to look at our fellow Christians and to miss what's truly there. That through faith they have a beauty that comes in Jesus. Appearances can be deceiving. Thank God for that. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. To God alone be all glory. Amen. We worship the Lord now with our offerings.
my prayer, O Lord. Keep me as the apple of your eye. In righteousness I shall see you. Be present, merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of life may find our rest in you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troubled life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed. The fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, Grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Be light in our darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this, of this night. For the love of your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and drive from them all the snares of the enemy. Let your holy angels dwell with us to preserve us in peace. And let your blessings be on us always. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Eternal God, the hours of both day and night are yours, and to you the darkness is no threat. Be present as we pray with those who labor in these hours of the night, especially those who watch and work on behalf of of others. Grant them diligence in their watching, faithfulness in their service, courage in danger, and competence in emergencies. Help them to meet the needs of others with confidence and compassion. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Abide with us, Lord, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us at the end of this day, at the end of our life, at the end of the world. Abide with us with your grace and goodness, with your holy word and sacrament, with your strength and blessing. Abide with us when the night of affliction and temptation comes upon us, the night of fear and despair, the night when death draws near. Abide with us and with all the faithful, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen.